The film Fight Club 1999 demonstrates exactly how we have fallen prey to consumerism. Our success is measured by what we can buy, how frequently we can buy stuff that we don't even need, how we can imitate the image of living the dream life. Thanks to technology, we can order food from our phones and it will probably get delivered in maybe 30 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. We can call a cab from our phones. We can have digital assistance. Things that used to take a lot of time doesn't require more than a few minutes nowadays. The world, our society, our lives, everything has become way too fast. And yet, we still don't have enough time for ourselves. So many people in the world have to work themselves literally to death. Overwork, longer working hours often cause things like strokes, cardiovascular diseases, etc. And people who are doing the so-called white collar jobs, even they, in many cases, just have to wait for the work week to be over. They wait for that Friday evening so that they can live for the weekend. And when the Sunday evening comes, our minds again start to worry about the work week ahead. After a day's work is over, our subconscious mind still thinks about work. Even at the age of technology, we still have to worry about how productive we are. So we are already consuming a lot of stuff. We are trying to make our lives easier. We are trying to live comfortably with so many advanced gadgets, nice clothes and whatnot. But on the other hand, we still don't have enough time for ourselves. Many people are just living for the weekends. And of course, many just straight away starve and die and just dream of having affordable healthcare. Why this disparity? Fight Club ends with this scene where the existing system crumbles down. But how does that happen? What happens after that? How is the new society built? Fight Club the film doesn't address those questions. What it does, though, is recognize our unhealthy obsession with consumption of products. It shows us a symptom of an underlying problem. A problem that requires illusions like this to clutter our minds. And that problem, that condition, is probably the elephant in the room. Capitalism is a really dynamic economic system. I mean, look at all the gadgets, the clothes, the cool stuff that we get because of capitalism, right? Instead of needlessly denigrating such a great and dynamic revolutionary system, we should probably just be, you know, thankful, grateful to capitalism and appreciate how revolutionary capitalism is. Well, that's what the advocates of capitalism like to say. But there's this other group of people who say the exact opposite. For example, this guy, who can influence you in a really, really bad way if he wants to. And this guy was kicked out of different countries at different points of his life, but, but he had a really nice beard, and so did his best friend. Now, now, he comes into the picture in the middle of the 19th century. Capitalism had already been around for 100 years by then. 150 years later, for this video, I'm still going to take some help from that guy. Okay, so let's start from the market. Consider this water bottle. Its purpose is holding water inside it. Or the camera I'm recording this with. It has the purpose of capturing photographs or videos. That is the utility of this product. Let's call this the use value, which means the utility or the purpose the object serves. So a camera's use value is capturing photographs. A bottle's use value is holding stuff like water. Now, in order for this bottle to become a commodity, it has to be transferred to someone else in exchange of some money, right? And that person is paying in order to have the use value, the utility of this bottle. But wait, here's the deal. This bottle is a commodity. This camera is also a commodity. 
but can we equate them in terms of their utility? Like the purpose served by one camera equals to the purpose served by 10 water bottles? No, we can't. No matter how hard it tries, a water bottle or even 10 water bottles, 100 water bottles can never capture a single photograph. But if we compare them in terms of their exchange value, then it will suddenly make sense. To quote from our bearded friend, as use values, commodities are above all of different qualities, but as exchange values, they are merely different quantities and consequently do not contain an atom of use value. Watches, clothes, phones, bottles, cameras, all these things are made from resources available in nature. You cannot conjure something up out of thin air. Unless you are a wizard of some kind and that's a case that I can't explain, sorry. Otherwise, everything is made from transforming the things that are already available in nature as materials. However, you cannot go around trying to sell metals or natural resources, right? We buy these commodities when they present us with some utility, which we call the use value. So there's something common in all these commodities that makes them sellable. And that is simple. That is human labor. With the touch of human labor, a watch becomes a watch. A bottle becomes a bottle. A camera becomes a camera. Well, we might use machines to make many things, but you get the point. Now, if you do a job, when and how do you go to the market? You do a job, you get a salary, you go to the market to buy stuff, and that's how you survive and stay able to do the job. You get a salary, you go to the market, and this loop continues. We'll get back to that in a moment. Let's come back to our question. So one camera in terms of price is equal to 10 bottles. Since we know that labor, human labor, is the element that makes a commodity eligible to be sold, how exactly do we measure human labor in numbers? How do we measure the quantity of labor? And here comes the interesting thing. Labor time. Yes, there's a reason many companies have timesheets for employees. There's a reason many companies have a minimum working hours rule. So our equation was like this, and yeah, now it becomes this. The labor time required to make one camera equals to the labor time required to make 10 bottles. Okay, so we can just be lazy and, you know, slack off and take more time to build the camera and, and we'll get paid more money, right? Well, no, because someone is definitely going to make it faster than you, cheaper than you, and that person is going to be paid. Our bearded friend says, the capitalist system expects you to take only the socially necessary labor time, not more than that. But wait, here's the question. Who determines, exactly who determines what is socially necessary labor time to produce something? Let's come back to our old flow. You do a job, you get a salary, you go to the market to buy stuff. So what's happening behind the scenes is that as a working class person, you two are selling a commodity, aka your labor power. In exchange, you get some money, which you use to buy other commodities, like, you know, the things that you need, food, dress, whatever. Our bearded friend calls this circuit CMC. The circuit CMC starts with one commodity and finishes with another, which falls out of circulation and into consumption. Consumption, the satisfaction of wants in one word, use value, is its end aim. But for the capitalist, the, the, this circuit becomes this. 
The capitalist uses money to buy commodities such as labor power, tools, resources and stuff like that and then uses them to generate more money. The circuit MCM dash on the contrary commences with money and ends with money. Its leading motive and the goal that attracts it is therefore more exchange value. More and more and more profit. Alright, so how is the price of commodity determined? That's going to answer a lot of mysteries here. So the capitalist spends around 200 bucks to get the tools, resources, materials needed to produce a bottle. Then as we see, labor power is also there. So the capitalist spends 100 bucks for labor power, let's assume. So he spends 300 bucks in total. The price of the commodity has to be more than 300 bucks for him to generate some profit. So if he sells the commodity for 500 bucks, where is the extra 200 bucks coming from? That's his profit, right? We get it. But where exactly is that value coming from? What exactly is creating the value? Remember, the resources and the tools cannot create value themselves. Your work, your labor power is the only commodity that generates value. So if there is an extra value of 200 bucks, it is generated by the workers labor power. And that is unpaid. To produce a commodity greater in value than the sum of the values of the commodities used to produce it, namely the means of production and the labor power he purchased with his good money on the open market, his aim is to produce not only use value, but value, and not just value, but also surplus value. That extra 200 bucks. The profit, that is the surplus value. Now if a worker can make a bottle in maybe 2 hours, that means 120 minutes, then that means he produces value of 500 bucks in 120 minutes. So he makes value of 1 buck in 120 by 500 minutes and to produce the value equal to what he is paid for means 100 bucks that's what he's paid for right he takes 120 by 500 multiplied by 100 minutes equals to 24 minutes rest of the time he works he is not paid for the capitalist's profit is generated from labor he has not paid for as we were discussing, the worker is paid only for the socially necessary labor time. The extra labor, which produces the profit, the surplus, is not paid for. Capitalists try to increase productivity so that the worker can produce the value equal to his payment in farther less time. So to make them work double and produce more value, more surplus but still be paid the same amount of money. Or maybe they can increase the working hours so that they can increase the surplus labor time, more surplus value, more profit. But how much surplus he's creating, the worker doesn't know that because it's abstract. And here comes the funny part. Workers think their wages are appropriate. They don't even know that there's something like surplus labor surplus value and that value is going into the hands of the capitalist and the worker is not being paid for that but this abstract exploitation is so fuzzy that all labor appear as paid labor even if it's unpaid the line between surplus labor and necessary labor between paid labor and unpaid labor is blurry capitalism works on capital it sucks the surplus unpaid labor. It generates profit, invests that again in getting more unpaid labor, generates more profit, 
and the cycle continues. New machines are invented, new technology, more surplus labor can be generated in less time. Capital is dead labor, which vampire-like lives only by sucking living labor and lives the more, the more labor it sucks. To live and to labor are the twined imperatives to which we are always already given. Together, they animate a rhythm of material production and reproduction that extends over time. And that's how capital progresses, makes everything faster and faster and faster. Multitasking. And capital breaks the barriers of countries. It expands itself into the entire world, outsourcing of jobs for cheap labor, opening up markets for the world. But only producing stuff is not going to be sustainable, right? You need to make people consume all the products. And that's where consumption comes in. The things that you own end up owning you. Instagram, protein buckets, shirts, pants, bikinis, phones, advanced gadgets every other day. They have to make us dance to the rhythm of products. The more products you own, the more sophisticated and expensive products you own, the more successful you are considered to be. The more you can influence other people. The more others are going to scroll and dream to have such life. And that makes sense. The more money you have in reality, the easier your lifestyle is going to be. The better healthcare you can afford, the better care you can take of your family. Many people say money doesn't matter. It's usually those people who have a lot of money. But again, when they say money doesn't matter, we all know it really does. Consumption for the sake of consumption. Capital doesn't care about what good it is creating for the society. At least what we can see from the climate crisis created by the greedy corporations. Nonetheless, you fall for it. I fall for it. We pay more buy the same stuff again and again don't have money all right just use your credit card in the end the things that you own end up owning you the things that you plan to own someday in the future end up owning you you are from the working class you created or at least someone like you created these products and in the end you have no control over the products you yourself have created. You become a slave to the products. Capitalism is not just creating products for the sake of humans. It's creating humans to cater to the products, to be enslaved by the products. Capital needs consumers to grow more and more and more and suck the labor power of the same consumers, but in a veiled manner. In this system, Work hard, party harder becomes get money for just the necessary labor time. Enjoy an illusion of happiness in all these fancy products. But wait, if there is overproduction, why is capitalism not being able to reduce global poverty? Why are people still homeless? Why is there not enough jobs? Well, that's a topic for another session. As I explained in the beginning, this video is going to address a problem which the films like Fight Club don't want to address. A problem which isn't just, you know, psychological demotivation or work stress of any or anything like that, but a problem that can be traced back to the material economic conditions of our system, of our society. And that's across the globe. Now, just like Fight Club doesn't, I didn't talk about a solution either because you know turns out there are multiple elephants in the room not just one and this guy seems to have found a solution for all of them maybe in some other video i'll talk about those but till then enjoy capitalism